My name is Len Johnson. I am the VA Outreach Specialist for the United States Department of Veteran Affairs. And my presentation today will focus on federal career opportunities and how to prepare yourself for the federal workforce and what steps you will need to take uh, from uh, exiting active duty personnel looking to apply for career opportunities with the federal government. Um, my primary focus is just to give you steps that you can take as active duty personnel coming off of orders uh, and how to be able to navigate uh, career opportunities with the federal government. Uh, in terms of understanding how to navigate career opportunities with the federal government, you need to know what steps to take, how to be able to navigate the federal career system, and what opportunities are available to you as a veteran exiting the military. So we're going to get started on different ways that you can be able to maximize your potential in order to get career opportunities or even get in for a job interview with the federal government. Uh, even though I work for the Department of Veteran Affairs, a lot of the different information that I'm going to be uh, giving to each and every one of you, it pertains to all federal agencies. So it does not matter, Department of Homeland Security, Social Security information, uh, agency administration, uh, Department of Treasury, um, Department of Energy, National Security Administration, doesn't make a difference. So all the information I'm giving to you, it works across all federal agencies. All federal agencies still fall under the Office of Personal Management. That's the federal clearinghouse for all federal careers, and you still have to go through under USA Jobs in order to apply for any uh, position throughout the federal government. So any information that I give you applies to every single uh, federal agency. So let's get started here. Some of the things that you need to be aware of when you're applying for um, any career opportunities with the federal government is, is to understand how to be able to navigate uh, these different federal agencies, different things like that. One of the things you need to understand, the nuances of navigating and seeking career, uh, federal careers um, is how to navigate different federal career sites. There's a host of different federal career sites like uh, USA Jobs, Feds Higher Vets, um, there's different programs called uh, Technical Career Fields, uh, Pathways Program. So there's a host of different uh, programs or uh, different career sites that you can navigate in order to look for different uh, career opportunities. And each federal agency has their own career site in, that you can go directly into in order to find out what career opportunities that they're posting. So I'll give you some, a couple, I have a couple of examples of that that you can look into. Also, maximizing your opportunities to get an interview, your resume will be your selling tool so that the agency who's looking at your qualifications say, okay, this individual has these qualifications, that individual has that qualification. These are the skill sets I would like to bring on to my particular agency in order to uh, have you work for our particular uh, company. Um, also, in creating the federal resume, there are certain things, catchwords or buzzwords that agencies are looking for when you create your federal resume. Um, th that's why I gave out a copy of my federal resume. Uh, uh, the sample that I actually that sample that I'm going to be going over, um, I have a copy from actually off of USA Jobs, which is the federal uh, site that you apply for federal job. But that pull that sample of an actual federal resume came off of the USA Jobs website. So that's something I'm gonna be going over in a few minutes to talk about, about how to create a federal resume. And also the information that they will be looking for. In particular, if you are an exiting service member who are coming off of Title 32 orders, you will now have the opportunity to be looked at as a veteran in terms of federal employment. On your federal resume, you need to let them know that you are now a veteran. What that does is give you veterans preference in terms of hiring. That makes a big difference. The reason is this, when you apply for a federal position, that bumps you up the ladder for employment, which means that if is Joe Smo civilian, is a civilian, you are the veteran, all things being way equal, let's just say Joe Smo civilian is a five-year mechanic, you're a five-year mechanic, but you're the one who's the veteran, that bumps you up the ladder in terms of employment. So using that veteran's preference is a strategic way for you to be uh, getting hired 
over other different veterans. You got to remember, United States citizens and over 320,000 uh, million American citizens throughout the country. How are you going to make your resume stand out from other different individuals throughout the country? And, and that veteran's preference is going to give you that leg up in order to uh, get your resume in there to get an interview for that particular job. And I'm going to go a little bit into that later on. Some of the different things that you're going to need to understand in terms of navigating these career opportunities is understanding your military experience and how to transfer it to civilian language based upon what particular field, whether you're in your medical field, finance field, engineering field, or whatever type of field that you're in. How can I translate my military skills into civilian language? Do not assume if you served in the military that civilians understand military language. Always assume in your mind that they do not. So you need to look at it as if they're, uh, they're reading a second grade lang language level. So you need to translate what you're doing in the military into language that they can understand as if they're in the second grade. Um, taking your rank. If you are E4 or greater and you supervise individuals, Right now, just from a show of hands, how many people in here have E4s and above? Raise your hand. If you supervise individuals, if you supervise anybody, you are a supervisor in the civilian world. You need to let individuals know that on your resume. When I was in the Marine Corps, I was an E4. I supervised eight junior enlisted personnel when I was in the Marine Corps. If I was to tell the, uh, the civilian folks I was an E-4 corporal in the Marine Corps, they would not know what on earth I am talking about. But if I tell them I was an E-4 supervisor in the Marine Corps, they would know what a supervisor is in, in the uh, civilian world. So you need to know, once again, get out of that mindset of speaking in military language, saying I'm an E-4, I was a sergeant, I was a staff sergeant. Civilians are not going to know what that is. But if you say I was an E-5, I was a, a, a E-4, I was a supervisor, I had eight individual junior enlisted personnel I supervised in whatever particular field, or if I was an E-5, I was a manager, I had X amount of individuals that I managed across whatever unit or whatever it is that you were, a particular field that you were in, Civilians are no, a civilian know what a manager is, a civilian know what a supervisor is, a civilian know what a regional manager is, so you have to put it in a language that they understand. Maximizing your professional skills based upon whatever uh, military skill set that you have, you have to make sure that you emphasize that in your uh, civilian, in your federal resume so that civilians can understand that. The average federal resume can be three to five pages long. The, the, and the federal government, we want to know your business. It's not like a civilian resume. The average civilian resume can be one to two pages long. A lot of people say, oh, I was always told that my resume has to be one to two pages long. Yes, if you're looking to work in Wall Street, you're looking to work at a regular uh, civilian job, yes. But in the federal government, we want to know your business. We can, Three to five pages long, you can put in, your, uh, in the federal resume. We want to know all the skill sets that you have so that we can understand exactly what it is that you're capable of doing and along with that, can you supervise individuals? You've got to remember the federal government has hundreds of thousands of employees going across the United States of America, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Virgin Islands. So we want to know that can you handle a, a, a department where you might have 20, 30 different people that you may need to supervise at a time. Right now, I'm going to give you a prime example. At the VA New York Harbor Healthcare System, I've, su I've supervised all at one time. Literally, um, when my program chief is out sometimes, I'm supervising 75 people in a day across four different campuses going from Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and Staten Island on, on a given day. That's just me by myself. You need to, people need to know that you can you have the capabilities of doing that. So, but, but once again, we don't know that unless you put that on your resume. So you have to let people know that. Don't assume that they're going to automatically understand that. Um, and another thing, use action verbs to describe a lot of your experiences. Have you managed? Have you supervised? Have you analyzed? Have you, um, in terms of fiscal responsibility, have you dealt with money? How much money have you dealt with? Wherever you can highlight money, always put it in the, in the federal government. We want to know, are, do you have the capability of, of handling millions of dollars? 
in the military, if you have anything to deal with purchasing cars, logistics, different things like that, you've already dealt with uh, dealing with large sums of money, purchase cars, different things of that nature, travel vouchers. So we want to know, can you deal with this large sums of money? If you're working in the Department of Treasury or anything, uh, big agencies, the IRS, anything like that, we want to know, can you deal with large volumes of money? So you need to let them know that, once again, don't assume that they're going to automatically figure this out and say, yes, I've worked in logistics in the military, and I was an a E-5 manager. Well, okay, if you worked in, you was an E-5 manager in logistics in the military, but you need to let them know how much a volume of material that you did manage across whether it is uh, department level, at the battalion level, regiment level, how much materials did you manage and what was the value of that uh, logistical material that you handled. So you need to let individuals know that and what was the value of that material that you handled. Does, does this Another good thing good also, um, in terms of navigating uh, some bragworthy items that you need to make sure that you uh, put on your resume. Security clearances. If you have a security clearance, make sure that you put information reference to security clearances. Um, certifications, honors, if you have uh, any particular honors that you may have had, awards, publications, special activities, volunteering assignments, if you had any uh, special uh, assignments that you did in your own private time that you volunteered, any particular memberships and any particular um, uh, uh, clubs or anything like that. Um, might be a, a member of the NAACP or any local um, Latino organization, different things of that nature like that. Uh, any particular computer skills, if you were involved in any IT uh, clubs, different things like that. Um, speak dual languages. Let, I'm going to let everyone know here, in the federal government, if you speak dual languages, you get paid extra money for speaking extra languages in the federal government. You can basically uh, negotiate your salary. It's a big thing, because once again, remember, the federal government not only deals with domestic um, issues, we deal with international issues. If you're working for the State Department and they need someone who speaks um, Farsi, or need someone who speaks uh, Mandarin, they need someone who might speak Hindu, different things of that nature, you can negotiate the salary just by the basis of you speaking another language and they will pay you extra money in that particular um, federal agency for you knowing dual languages. So you can negotiate your salary based upon that. Um, you have any particular endorsements, like a CDL, hazmat endorsement, if you have any particular commercial driver's license, so different endorsements. Public speaking, if you've um, done different public speaking engagements, please make sure you put that on your resume. Trainings, if you were involved in any particular training, special assignments, like right now, this COVID operations is, is a special assignment. You need to put that on your resume. So all this stuff right here, you need to make sure you're putting that on your resume because once again, civilians are not going to know this information. So you need to make sure that civilians are aware of this particular information. Now, once again, this is an actual copy of a federal resume that I pulled off of the USA Jobs website. The reason why I pulled this off of the USA Jobs website, this is just a template. Your resume doesn't have to look exactly like this, but you need to make sure that the information is on your resume. Which means this, the very top of that, um, if you look at the top of that resume, where it says, after country or country, it says veterans preference. Each one of you who are coming off of Title 10 or Title 32 orders will have that, will qualify for that veterans preference. You need to make sure that is on the very first top of your page because that way when, um, when you upload your resume into USA Jobs, it's a computer that's looking at your resume first before the employer gets your, 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 your resume. So it's like 10,000 resumes are going through that computer for that particular job. How is your resume going to stand out? And if that job says that it has a veteran's preference, your application gets pulled. By virtue of you having that marker on there that says veteran's preference, yes. Served in the Army, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 X, Y, Z. Now, when they pull that application, they say, okay, this, this person, individual is a veteran, we have a hiring preference for that veteran. Now, with you having that hiring preference for that veteran, that pulls your application. If there's a veteran preference, they can hire you just because of that. 
So we need to make sure that the information is on there. Another thing I always ask, um, in USA Job, they do have a template where you're able to um, type in your information and it will create the um, resume for you. I strongly encourage don't do that. Take a Word document, 12 font, Times Roman, and create your own resume on, on a Word document. Because what happens is when you use that template on USA Jobs, and then when you finally hit submit, it comes out a little bit awkward and everything else. Like it doesn't look the way you would like it to look. So create your own, just use a regular Word document, blank Word document, use 12 font, Times Roman, it looks very uh, professional. Create your own document and you upload it into USA Jobs. So it's very simple, that's all you need to do. Um, and then just make sure that you have all that particular information there, information in reference to your education. Another thing, we all know from the military, there's a simple saying, duties as a sign. That is called collateral duties in the civilian world. Even though you might be, let's say, um, you might, let's say your, your actual MOS is hazmat. But we know along with hazmat, you might get pulled to do uh, security guard duty or something of that nature. But it's not on your DD-214 what your actual MOS is. That, is. that is called a collateral duty. You need to make sure that that is on your resume. You could put all the different collateral assignments that you have on your resume. So you're, yes, your initial MOS is hazmat, whether X, Y, Z, but to make sure you put all those individual collateral duties that you've done in the military up under your primary uh, MOS duty. Because we also want to know that you're, you're have, you have the capabilities of doing other different assignments. Even within the federal government, they're called stretch assignments in the federal government. You might be assigned, oh, I'll give you a prime example. I was, um, I was at the transition patient advocate for the oef -OIF program when I first uh, came along with, with the VA. But then I had, they had the actual volunteers to do a stretch assignment with the director's office. And I got a volunteer assignment when they was uh, fixing up the VA hospital and they needed a team of people to work with, uh, to work with the engineering department under the project management office. And I got a stretch assignment with them for six months had nothing to do with what my actual job description was, but I put that on my resume. And it, and it showed that, look, I was more than willing to go outside the box of my actual job duties, and that looks good for the employer, because it showed that you're willing to go above and beyond what you normally do, and I got an award for that. So these are different things that you need to do in terms of making sure that you put a, a different section there under your collateral duties, different things like that. Any different trainings, make sure you put your, um, there's a section there you can put on your federal resume for trainings, awards, different things of that nature. So make sure you have all that different information. And once again, don't assume nothing uh, that the civilian world is gonna automatically assume that you're, you're this great super soldier. No, they do not know that. You need to make sure that you put this information down for them so that they can be aware of that. And another thing, you must always tailor your resume based upon what the job description entails. In every single job that is posted on your USA Jobs website, there is something that's called a KSA, Knowledge, Skills, and Ability. This is where they would actually tell you what the job is about and the questions that they're basically, they're giving you the answer to what they're looking for in that job. So let's say for if the job is a medical assignment, they will let you know the job is a medical assignment and they will say, um, we're looking for Jane Doe, who has the skills of knowledge of working with um, hazmat materials for over one year. So, well, you need to say, in your response or in your resume, I have worked with hazmat materials in this assignment for X, Y, Z years. So you need to make sure in your resume that you're saying exactly what it is that they're asking or stating in their response on that, um, on that uh, uh, job description, the posting that they put out there. So just make sure for each one of those bullets inside your resume, you're responding to each one of those bullets that they have on that particular resume. I see so many times where uh, individuals have good resumes, outstanding resumes. So I've seen some very good resumes, but when I look at the actual job posting, they have nothing what they're talking about on their resume versus the job posting that they have up there. So just please make sure that you read it, don't just glance over it, you say, oh, 
This is a hazmat position. I've been hazmat in the military. I have exactly what they're looking for. Yes, you may have, once again, do not assume that they know everything about you. You must respond based upon that bullet that they're saying inside that job description and make sure that that job description is inside the resume. But one thing you do not do, don't cut and paste. Do not cut and paste what they said inside your resume. Change the wording around because they said, oh, he just basically took the words from off our job description and put it on his resume. You're going to get caught. And it's just not, it's just not going to look good because basically it's going to show that you're lazy. So you just, you know, try, please don't do anything of that nature. Just, you know, read the word, one or two sentences within that bullet just to, just to respond to what that job description is saying. And, and, that, and I guarantee you, a lot of times you will get at least get, get into the interview. The whole point of you setting your resume up, responding to what they're asking in the KSAs, putting all your information down is to get you into that interview. Once you get into that interview, I'm pretty sure that each and every one of you can sell yourself to get in for that job. But the whole point is just to get you there to that interview. And that's the whole purpose of me giving you the information right here. Once again, I, I was able to put uh, like a basically a split screen of the difference between the different rank structure, how the civilians look at it versus how uh, the military structure look at it. So I was able to basically cross reference it in terms of if you're E4, you supervise uh, individuals in the civilian world, you will be looked at as a frontline supervisor. If you were an E5 sergeant, you will basically be looked at as a frontline manager. Um, in the civilian world. If you are an E6 staff sergeant, uh, you will basically be looked at as a branch manager in the civilian world, E7 a district manager, and an E8 a regional manager. And that's how uh, basically how the civilian world will look at you in terms of how you can be able to interpret on your resume in order to help the civilians understand it. Because I guarantee you, once again, in the civilian world, if you were to say I was an E5 or E6 staff sergeant or anything like that, they're not gonna understand what you're talking about. So you wanna try to make it as plain to them as, as possible so that they can be able to digest what you're saying in terms of helping them um, you know, with, to understand what it is that's on your resume. Because a lot of times, I can guarantee you, the basic you know, E5, E6, they're handling at least over 10 to 20 personnel per unit, um, you know, based upon what their duties are. And those are normally like, man in the civilian world, those are like managers. Uh, so, and like I said, E4, E5s, those are like basically supervisors and managers. And they're normally handling anybody between five to 10 people uh, in the civilian world. So just make sure on your resume that you reflect that um, when you, uh, you know, make sure in your resume so that people can understand it. Because even now we got in the military, we've even got some E3s that are supervising individuals based upon where they're assigned. So, you know, but if, if you basically, if you are supervising someone in the military, you're a supervisor in a civilian world. So just make sure you reflect that in, on your documents. Because once again, based upon whatever job it is that you're applying for in the federal government, that job description might say we're looking for someone to supervise and oh backtrack a little bit when you normally scroll down to the bottom left of the federal job description it'll say supervisory position yes or no you'll always it will always say on that job description it will say supervisory position yes or no so you will know if it says supervisory position yes then you know you need to make sure on that resume you talk about everything about being a supervisor. If it says supervisory position no, then you know it's discretionary what it is that you uh, need to talk about on that, um, that your, your resume. Um, once again, this is for all officer class. I know you may not have too many people here as an officer class, um, but this is some of the information in reference to your officer class. I'm not gonna go a little bit too much into that. Um, now, another thing, if any of you individuals who have deployed for the federal government, we got to recognize within the federal government, we see all, we deal with all types of, of citizens who talk thousands of different languages. If you deploy within the military, these are the type of skills that we're looking for. Anyone who deal with, can deal with multi-language multi uh, individuals, deal with multiculturalism, 
different things of that nature. All that counts on your resume. We're always looking for individuals who can deal with diverse populations, diverse people. You need to make sure that's reflected on your resume. I'm gonna give you a prime example. I deployed to Egypt. I've, I've been in a station in Japan. I've been stationed in Korea. I've been in Germany. I make sure all that information is documented on my resume because people want to know that you've dealt with different um, countries, populations, people, because when you're dealing with working in the federal agency, let's give me a prime example, Department of Homeland Security, what's the biggest thing now? The borders. They want to know that you deal with can deal with foreign nationals, different things of that nature. Um, if you're working with the State Department, the State Department, that's all they do is deal with uh, foreign nationals in different countries, different things like that. So you want to make sure that that's reflected on your resume. Um, right, so may be very mindful to make sure you have that information on your resume. And once again, if you speak multiple languages, make sure that's reflected on your resume. Um, and another thing, if you dealt with any type of, uh, in terms of foreign relations, if you were like uh, escorted uh, different foreign diplomats, different things of that nature, make sure that's reflected on your resume. Um, if you dealt with uh, a translator, in different foreign countries. Make sure that's reflected in your resume. All that, but once again, all that counts when you are applying for different, um, different agencies, especially the agencies that deal with a lot of, uh, you know, dealing with foreign countries like the State Department, um, a lot of the CIA, different things like that, FBI, a lot of those particular agencies are gonna come in a lot of contact with foreign countries. All right. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of a special hiring authority. I, I talked to you a little bit about the veterans preferences, but there are a host of other different veterans preference and special hiring authorities that you need to be aware of. One of the first ones is the veterans recruitment appointment. These are for pos positions up to GS-11 um, for disabled, and the categories are disabled veterans, wartime veterans, which is current, Right now, we're still within the Persian Gulf War time period. We're still at war. So this applies to each and every one of you. And veterans separated within the last three years. No minimum service requirement, which means right now, if you're on Title 32 orders for a COVID mission, you fall in this category. You fall under the veterans recruitment appointment, which means you do not have to be a disabled veteran. If you separated from Title 32 orders within the last three years, and you receive a DD-214, you fall under this veteran recruitment appointment, which means basically if there is a position within the federal government in any federal agency, they can hire you off this recruitment authority, which means if there's a civilian versus you, they can give you the job. That is called the VRA appointment. This has nothing to do with the uh, being a disabled veteran. You do not have to have a service-connected disability in order to get hired under this authority. So be mindful of that when you look at these job announcements. If you look on the right-hand corner, it'll say who may apply for this position. It'll say either veteran VRA, because it'll more likely be these big acronyms. <laughs> it'll be VRA, which is Veterans Recruitment Authority. It could be SC, which is Service Connected uh, Authority, or it could be civilian, blah, 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 blah. But you're not worried about the civilian because you're a veteran. But, you still can apply as a civilian because you have the right as an American citizen to apply for something that, that's open to the general public, but you get those higher, higher preferences as someone who served in the military, and that better VRA appointment is something that you qualify for. The second category is 30% or more disabled veteran. This is the highest hiring category that you can have as someone who served, served prior military. The 30% or more disabled veterans category is an appointment for an eligible veteran who meets the job qualification to a position. And the veteran's preference does not apply and no announcement posting is required. Basically what it means, I'm gonna give you a prime example, this is how I got this job. If I'm the person, I'm 80% service connected from the Marine Corps. If all things being way equal, I'm 30% or more service connected, that veteran is not 30% or more service connected. I have the qualifications for the job. They don't even have to interview that veteran. Just give me the job. Have a nice day. Because I'm 30% or more service connected. That is, that is the rule. That is the law if you're 30% or more service connected. And that's across any federal agency in the United States of America, 
Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Islands. That is the highest uh, hiring authority in the United States federal government for any a veteran who is 30% or more service connected. Doesn't make a difference if you just got separate. That VRA, uh, VRA does not count. That 30% or more service connected veteran gets the highest category in the United States of America. So just p keep that in mind um, when you're applying for different positions. All right, the not other categories, the veteran, the VEOA, the Veterans Appointment Opportunity Act of 1998, federal agencies must allow eligible preference veterans to apply for position announced under merit promotion procedures when the agency is recruiting from outside its own workforce. Basically, it means if there is a position posting, when it, uh, a federal agency posts a position, they must also allow veterans to have the opportunity to, to post, uh, apply for certain positions that are being posted at some of those federal agencies, and it's across the board for all federal agencies. They still have to give veterans opportunities to apply for some of those jobs. That's the Veterans Appointment Act of 1998. But once again, you have the VRA, you have the 30% or more services able or hiring authority. Those are just those few hiring authorities. There are still more. But once again, it's that 30% or more, that's, that's the big dog out of all of them. The other hiring authority is a Schedule A letter. A Schedule A letter is for hiring people with severe physical disabilities, mental health disabilities, and intellectual disabilities. Basically, um, these hiring authorities, even civilians can apply for these positions. They, the, um, the federal government still has to um, hire individuals with disabilities across the board. We can't discriminate against anyone in the federal government. So you might be an individual who might be blind, you might be an individual who might be deaf, be in a wheelchair, different things like that, might have different cognitive uh, uh, disabilities, different things like that. The federal government still must uh, hire these individuals and can't discriminate. And they also can apply under the Schedule A hiring authority. So, and it, this has nothing to do with a veteran, but if a veteran is not service connected, but they have one of these disabilities, they still can apply under one of these particular hiring authorities. So it's still open to veterans to apply if you have one of these particular uh, conditions. Uh, another thing, there's a certain Schedule A hiring authority for, uh, for people like uh, interpreters or people who are, who are hiring readers. So let's say for example, you're like um, to help deaf people and, and do like the sign language, different things like that. There's certain hiring authorities for these particular individuals also. So that you can be also um, able to, um, they're looking to hire people who do those particular type of skill sets. You can apply for different positions within the federal government also. So there's a host of different uh, schedule hiring authorities. When you go on the USA job site, just, just type in the search in the special hiring authorities and all this information will come up on the website. It's SF-15. The SF-15 is one of the documents that you will need in, to upload into USA Jobs in order for you to get the veteran's preference. So normally when you will go onto USA Jobs, and I'm gonna show you in a minute, you go on that website, there's certain documents you need to have uploaded in there before you start applying for these particular jobs. This is one of them. The first one is your DD-214 to prove that you're a veteran. If you want that veteran's preference, you have to make sure that your DD-214 is uploaded in that system when you start applying for the jobs for that veteran's preference. But the second one is this SF-15. The SF-15 is basically just validating that I'm a veteran and I'm asking for that veteran's preference for whatever particular job it is that you're um, looking to apply for. And another thing, your spouse can apply, if you are married, your spouse can apply for your veteran's preference if you're not looking to work for the federal government. So let's say, for instance, if you're a veteran, you, you're a 10% 10, 10 or more service disabled, but you don't want to work for the federal government. So let's say, for instance, you might have a civilian job already, and you might be working for NYPD or the fire department or any of these particular other agencies and you would like to, um, you don't want, you already got a nice city job or a nice civilian job, but you want your wife or, or you know, spouse, whatever, uh, you know, gender that you, you are, and you would like for them to work for the federal government and use your veteran's preference, you can do that. You will take this, a copy of this SF-15 form, a copy of your DD-214, and a copy of your VA award letter saying that you're a 10% or more disabled veteran, and a copy of the marriage certificate saying that that's your spouse, everything else like that, and they can apply and use your 
of veterans' preference for a federal job. All right, another program within the federal government is called the Technical Career Field. The, the Technical Career Field is where you will come in, uh, it's basically an apprenticeship where you will be under a mentor for over uh, two, up, up to one to two years in the federal government, but you will come in as a high grade position, normally up to GS, GS 11 position within the federal government, and then when you get hired, normally it's a way for you to get your foot in the door for a federal job, and that's across all federal agencies. And then when you will come in, you will be assigned a mentor, somebody who will guide you on the, the federal government, basically work your way in. Then once you get a, a grasp of how the federal government works, you'll be brought on as a full-time federal employee, and a lot of those jobs lead into supervisory or managerial positions. My, um, actually, my program chief, who's now over me, he came in as a technical career field before, like three, four years ago, and now he's my boss. And he's like a GS 13, 14 now. So he's making like six figures now. This is, this is a really good field, because a lot of, they get a lot of the people coming straight out of college. And it's open to veterans, veterans can apply also. So it's a really good field. And these are all the different uh, career tracks that you can uh, use with this technical career field. And this, once again, this is across all federal agencies that you can apply for different positions um, with the technical career field. So, so what I'm a, I, I, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, after we finish this uh, the, the recording. Um, the Senior Executive Service. The senior SES Corps is for a corps executive selected for the leadership qualities. A lot of these uh, SES Corps come from like, they're more like the officer corps, a lot of senior staff NCOs, a lot of individuals like that, um, apply for a lot of these positions, because a lot of these positions are like high functioning positions. So we normally, but I must just put the information out there uh, for anyone who is interested in any position. You know, anyone can apply, but a lot of times they look for a lot of officer class, uh, senior, senior NCO class to apply for these positions. On um, pathways, what I talked about a little bit earlier, pathways are basically internships. You come in as an intern, they look for mostly uh, recent grads or current grads who go for master's, undergrads, apprenticeship programs, you're going for any engineering fields, different things like that. It's a way for you to get your foot in the door for a federal uh, career. Um, a lot of these are paid positions where you would basically come in as an apprentice uh, with a princess or an intern at whatever particular federal agency and there's a way for you to get your foot in the door. A lot of times they roll you over for full-time government positions. And once again, this is across all federal agencies, not just the VA. So you can apply for this for all uh, uh, jobs. The Presidential Management Fellows is run out of the White House for anyone interested in working in the White House. They have their own hiring authority, different things like that, because you know if you're gonna be working uh, for the president, they're gonna do their own background check, different things like that. But this, this is another internship opportunity working in Washington, D.C. Uh, under the president, and uh, a way to get your foot in the door with a lot of these senior executives within the White House. This is another a website, it's called Fed Hires Vets. Um, this is another good resource tool in order to navigate all different opportunities for veterans across all federal agencies. Um, and you go on, and it's open to veterans and the spouse, so your wife, uh, if, uh, why be not gender specific, if your spouse is eligible to apply for these particular uh, assistance from this particular uh, website in order for any different federal career opportunities. Uh, the USA job site, once again, I talked a little bit about that. Um, USA Jobs is the Office of Personal Management official one-stop source for federal job and employment information. You cannot get hired at any federal agency unless you go through the Office of Personal Management. That's the only way you're going to get hired within any federal agency because they're the clearinghouse. They do all the background checks. They're the ones who do all the qualifications for you to come on board across any federal agency. It doesn't make a difference with CIA, VA, Social Security. You have to go through them in order to get hired through the federal government because they're, they're basically the human resources for the federal government. And once again, I talked about some of those documents that you definitely need to upload into their system before you start applying if you're a veteran in order to get hired with, with um, any federal agency. Uh, one of the documents is the OF-306, that's the Declaration for Federal Employment, the SF-15, the Veteran's Preference, the Schedule A letter, hiring authority for persons with disabilities, 
the VA award letter saying you're 30% or more disabled or 100% permanent and total letter for spouses or parent or veteran for unemployment. Those are some of the documents you definitely should, should upload into the USA job uh, website before you start applying for federal positions because I guarantee you if you're looking to get that veteran's preference, they're going to ask you for this. There's no way you're going to get around getting any federal position because they will ask you for these documents before you start applying or you're asking for a veteran's preference for you or your spouse. And these are some of the fields of placement that you can work at while you're using your VA work study program. Um, right now, I'm the supervisor for the uh, work study program here in the New York City area. And last semester, spring, I had 125 work study students working um, at the VA Medical Center. So it's a really good program. And I said about a third of them got hired full time with the federal government uh, through my program. So these are some of the other inf information in reference to some of the other placement at the VA uh, Medical Center that we able to get employment. And that is the end of my presentation. I hope that you got a lot of information in reference to uh, a lot of career opportunities. And once again, even though I work for the Department of Veteran Affairs, all the information that I gave you applies to all federal agencies. So hopefully this information can empower you to be able to uh, get some valuable information in order to apply for federal careers. Thank you very much and hope everything worked out for you.